diseases caused by bacteria and viruses. We share this planet with prokaryotes and viruses, and most of the time we are never aware of our relationship with them. Often these relationships are highly beneficial, but in some cases, sharing simply doesn't work and disease is the result. How do bacteria cause disease? Bacteria causes disease by destroying living cells or by releasing chemicals that upset homeostasis. Microorganisms, viruses, and prokaryotes that cause disease are called pathogens. At the present time, all known prokaryotic pathogens are bacteria. However, in the future, scientists may discover archaea associated with disease. Louis Pasteur has helped to establish what has become known as the germ theory of disease when he showed that bacteria were responsible for a number of human and animal diseases. Bacteria produce disease in one or two general ways. Some bacteria destroy the living cells and tissue in the infected organism, while some cause tissue damage when they provoke a response from the immune system. Other bacteria release toxins or poisons that interfere with the normal activity of the host. Some common human bacterial diseases are shown in this table. Lyme disease, bullseye is a rash at the site where the tick bite appears, fever, fatigue, headache, and transmission by ticks. Tetanus, the effect of is lockjaw, stiffness of the neck and abdomen, difficulty swallowing, fever, elevated blood pressure, and severe muscle spasms. The bacteria enter the body through a break in the skin. Tuberculosis, fatigue, weight loss, fever, night sweats, chills, appetite loss, bloody sputum from the lungs. And the transmission, bacterial particles are inhaled. A disease, bacterial meningitis, high fever, headache, stiffness, nausea, fatigue, and it's transmitted with the bacteria are spread in respiratory droplets caused by coughing or sneezing, close or prolonged contact with someone infected with meningitis. Strep throat, effect on the body is a fever, a sore throat, headache, fatigue, nausea, and it is transmitted by direct contact with mucus from an infected person or direct contact with infected wounds or breaks in the skin. One example of bacterial pathogen that damage host tissue is the bacterium that causes tuberculosis. This pathogen is inhaled into the lungs where its growth triggers an immune response that can destroy large areas of lung tissue. The bacterium also may enter a blood vessel and travel to other sites in the body, causing similar damage where the body tries to fight the tuberculosis but hurts the organ. Bacteria that produces toxin include the species that causes diphtheria and the species responsible for a deadly form of food poisoning known as botulism. Diphtheria has largely been eliminated in some countries, but outbreaks of botulism still claim many lives. Although most bacteria are harmless and many are beneficial, the everyday risks of any person acquiring a bacterial infection are great enough to warrant effects to control bacterial growth. Various control methods are used. Washing hands or other surfaces with soap under running water doesn't kill pathogens, but it helps dislodge both bacteria and viruses. Chemical solutions that kill bacteria can be used to clean bathrooms, kitchens, hospitals, and other places where bacteria may flourish. Low temperatures, like those inside a refrigerator, will slow the growth of bacteria and keep most foods fresher for longer periods of time. The sub serial temperature of a freezer essentially keeps bacteria from growing at all. Boiling, frying, and steaming can sterilize many kinds of food by raising the temperature of the food to a point where the bacteria cannot live. Sterilization of objects, steriliz sterilization of objects such as medical equipment, at temperatures well above 100 degrees Celsius can prevent the growth of bacteria. Most bacteria cannot survive such temperatures. A number of drugs can be used to attack bacterial infections. These drugs include antibiotics. 
such as penicillin and tetracycline that block the growth of reproduction of bacteria. Antibiotics disrupt protein and cell processes that are specific to bacterial cells. In this way, they are intended to do no harm to the host cells. However, significant interruption to the intestinal tract microbiome is the result of using antibiotics. Rebuilding the complex system of bacteria is important after any antibiotic regime. Antibiotics are not effective against viral infections. Some bacterial or viral diseases are purported to be prevented by stimulating the body's immune system with vaccines. When injected into the body, a vaccine is designed to prompt the body to produce immunity to a specific disease. Immunity is the body's ability to destroy the pathogens or inactivated viruses. Some vaccines include weakened or killed pathogens or inactivated viruses. Also, vaccines often include an adjuvant. The adjuvant triggers the body's immune response because it is a toxin like aluminum or mercury, which are dangerous for the body. So how do viruses cause disease? Viruses cause disease by directly destroying living cells or by affecting cellular functions in ways that upset homeostasis. Like bacteria, viruses produce disease by disrupting the body's normal homeostasis. Viruses produce serious animal and plant diseases as well. Some common human viral diseases are shown in the table. The common cold, sneezing, sore throat, fever, headache, muscle aches, and the way it was transmitted, contact with contaminated objects, droplet inhalation, sneezing, coughing. Influenza, body aches, fever, sore throat, headaches, dry cough, fatigue, nasal congestion. In the transmission, flu viruses spread in the respiratory droplets caused by coughing and sneezing. Of course, the common cold and influenza are very similar. AIDS, effect on the body, the helper T cells, which are needed for normal immune system response, are destroyed. In the transmission, contact with contaminated blood or bodily fluids, mothers can pass it on to their babies during delivery or during breastfeeding. Chicken pox. The effect on the body is skin rashes or blistering lesions. It is transmitted by virus particles and spread in respiratory droplets caused by coughing and sneezing. It's highly contagious. Hepatitis B, effects on the body is jaundice, fatigue, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, joint pain. It's transmitted by contact with contaminated blood or bodily fluid. West Nile disease, effect on the body is a fever, headache, or body ache, and it's transmitted by the bite by an infected mosquito. The human palpomova virus, the effect on the body is genital or anal warts, also cancer of the cervix, penis, or and anus. It's transmitted by sexual contact. In many viral infections, viruses attack and destroy certain cells in the body, causing the symptoms of the disease. Poliovirus, for example, destroys cells in the nervous system, producing paralysis. Other viruses cause infected cells to change their pattern of growth and development, sometimes leading to cancer. Many vaccines have been developed in the last three centuries. Today, there are vaccines against more than two dozen infectious diseases. Are they effective? Looking at the history, in 1769, Edward Jenner performed the first inoculations against smallpox using the less harmful but similar cowpox virus. In 1880, Louis Pasteur developed vaccines against anthrax and rabies. In 23, Albert Calmet and Camille Guerin developed a vaccine against tuberculosis. In the 50s, Jonas Salk developed a polio vaccine that uses inert viruses. Albert Sabine developed a polio vaccine that uses weakened viruses. Before the advent of polio vaccine, hospitals were filled with polio-stricken children in machines called iron lungs, which helped them breathe. Historically, even before 1919, 
Before the vaccine development, the Red Cross made public aware of the threat of tuberculosis using posters such as this one. In 81, a vaccine against hepatitis B that uses recombinant DNA gains government approval. In 86, U.S. President Reagan signed a bill exempting vaccine manufacturers from liability. Any vaccine-related injury compensation is not paid by the vaccine manufacturer, but the U.S. government. 2006, a vaccine against human papilloma virus, a virus known to cause certain cancers, gains approval. In 21, an mRNA vaccine used against COVID did not see success it had touted. Death rates and hospitalizations for vaccinated populations were similar to the unvaccinated. In addition, there are reports of dangerous side effects from the COVID vaccines. Are these negative reports true? What double-blind studies have been done on vaccines, especially the COVID vaccines? Cold and flu viruses are potentially transmitted by hand-to-mouth contact. Effective ways to help prevent infection include washing your hands, avoiding contact with sick individuals, and coughing and sneezing into a tissue or your sleeve, not into your hands. Cold and flu viruses are unique in that they change, whether naturally or aided, and they work as a parasite. For this reason, vaccines are ineffective, as we have seen. One very powerful way to build immunity to cold and flu viruses is naturally. After being exposed to a virus and recovering, the body recognizes and withstands better the next time it faces the same or similar virus. The survival rate for those who have had a cold or flu is very high. The new flu vaccines are reported to damage natural immunity. If the aim is to build herd immunity, where the general population is able to hold out so that the virus passes, the natural immunity is best. What do you think? Unlike bacterial diseases, viral diseases cannot be treated with antibiotics. In recent years, limited progress has been made in developing a handful of antiviral drugs that attack specific viral enzymes that host cells do not have. Also, these treatments include an antiviral medication that can help speed recovery from flu virus. Fortunately, traditional medications and inexpensive antiviral treatments have been safely used for many years. These successful preventions and treatments have been mocked. Why? Why are emerging diseases particularly threatening to human health? The pathogens that cause emerging diseases are particularly threatening to human health because human populations have little or no resistance to them and because methods of control have not yet been developed. What is the source of these emerging pathogens? If pathogenic viruses and bacteria were unable to change, whether naturally or with human interference, they would pose far less of a threat. Unfortunately, the short time between successive generations of pathogens allows them to change rapidly, especially in response to human efforts to control them. An unknown disease that appears in a population for the first time or a well-known disease that suddenly becomes harder to control is called an emerging disease. This map shows locations worldwide where specific emerging diseases have broken out in recent years. In recent years, these new diseases, such as Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, SARS, in Asia, have appeared. At the same time, these diseases thought to be under control have come back. E. coli, two locations, multidrug-resistant tuberculosis, diphtheria, West Nile virus, dengue, Ebola, cholera, Changes in lifestyle and commerce have made emerging diseases even more a threat. High-speed travel means that a person can move halfway around the world in a day. Huge quantities of food and consumer goods are now shipped between regions of the world that previously had little contact with each other. Human populations that were once isolated by oceans and mountains are now in close contact with developed parts of the world. The possibility of rapid spread of new diseases is a risk of every trip a person takes and every shipment of food and goods. 
Because of their sudden appearance and resistance to existing control methods, emerging diseases are of particular concern. Deeper understanding of the functions of the molecular structure and genetics of bacteria and viruses will be one key to defending against them. Will you be the next Nobel Prize winner? When first introduced in the 1940s, penicillin, an antibiotic derived from fungi, was a miracle drug. Patients suffering from life-threatening infections were cured almost immediately by the powerful new drug. Within a few decades, however, penicillin lost much of its effectiveness, as have other more current antibiotics. The culprit is natural selection, as the bacteria that are resistant to prescribed drugs survive and are allowed to propagate. The widespread use of antibiotics has led to a process of natural selection that favors the emergence of resistance to these powerful drugs. Now must fight superbugs that are resistant to whole groups of antibiotics and that transfer drug-resistant genes from one bacteria to another through conjugation. An especially dangerous form of multiple drug resistance has recently appeared in common bacterium, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, known as MRSA, can cause infections that are especially difficult to control. MRSA skin infections can be spread by close contact, including the sharing of personal items such as athletic gear, and are especially dangerous in hospitals, where MRSA bacteria can infect surgical wounds and spread from patient to patient. Infections by MRSA can be very serious or fatal for people in hospitals and nursing homes who have weaker immune systems. This table shows the incidence of MRSA infections in the US hospitals during a 13 year period. The increase has been significant from 2000 to almost 400,000 cases. I'm curious what the death rate was. In 1972, Stanley Prusiner became interested in scrapie, an infectious disease in sheep, the exact cause of which was unknown. Experiments revealed clumps of tiny protein particles in the brains of infected sheep. Prusiner called these particles prions, short for protein infectious particles. Prions are misfolded proteins in the brain that cause a chain reaction of misfolding in other normal proteins they contact, eventually clogging the brain tissue and causing disease. Many animals, including humans, can become infected with prions. How prions cause disease is similar in some ways to viral infection. Are prions another disease like a virus?